Hold. And without further ado, thank Frank Fiambrianzo. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for your time. I know that's the one commodity we don't have enough of uh, nowadays. So my name is Frank Fiorenza. I am a registered respiratory therapist. I have 19 years experience in the cardiac and general ICU, uh, obviously bedside RT, uh, but as mentioned, I'm also the inventor and developer of the Fluso products. Uh, my time at the bedside, I would disconnect uh, the ventilator circuit. I would stuck the, stick the tip of the circuit under the pillow uh, because we all know it's sterile under there. And, you know, patient would lose all peep. Uh, you know, what would be buried in the air? And there must be a better way. So how can we manage these patients better knowing that we have such advanced um, university hospitals, standard hospitals, all the modalities av available to us? How can we improve on that? So we're gonna be talking a lot about PEEP, uh, positive end expiratory pressure for all the RTs on the call. Uh, you hear the acronym PEEP 8,900 times a day, it's thrown out everywhere. Uh, so if we were to go on PubMed, the research portal and type in PEEP, you actually get third, almost 31,000 different articles that contain PEEP. High peep, low peep, best peep, no peep, titrate peep, optimal peep. It's just peepity peep. It's everywhere. But if you type in circuit disconnect to which you lose 100% of your peep, there's only 591 articles. Uh, most of them come up circuit, meaning like electrical plug circuit. Uh, and, and on that screen, actually, uh, the number three article is a, an article on Fluso. And I think it's looking at peep as an important aspect of lung protective ventilation. So if we're trying to optimize it, why don't we keep it? So how often do we disconnect? Oh, you know what, I hear a lot, I don't disconnect that often, or it's very infrequent, or we don't transport patients that much. But in our mindsets at the bedside, I don't calculate how often I disconnect, because if I have a patient that's on a ventilator in the ICU, and I need to switch them to a transport ventilator to go to MRI, I disconnect them and I move it over. You don't think about it, right? It's just, I need to complete this task. This is how it's done. And so it goes unregistered for the majority of the time. But when we start to look at this list, you know, you've got 18 different therapies listed going, this is happening every day in every hospital around the world. I'm changing a circuit. I'm adding a nebulizer. I'm going on a transport. I'm switching a, a filter on a ventilator, and the list goes on and on, bronchoscopy, uh, replacing HME, proning patient, which became very popular during COVID. So all these different therapies, and really at present before Fluso, uh, there was only two solutions. And one is to the, the art of delivering inhaled medications, uh, whether that be a, a nebulizer or an MDI, but you still physically have to get these adapters into the circuit. So you have to break the circuit to put those adapters in. Uh, and alongside that is inline closed suction systems. So most likely the Avano system is the most popular. Um, and I guarantee, I, don't, I really don't know one hospital that doesn't use uh, inline suction catheters. Uh, so with an inline suction catheter, there's no research that actually indicates it does anything other than maintain PEEP and stop airborne uh, aerosols. So you're trying to keep the PEEP once again, uh, but adding in a device like Fluso uh, will give you 18 different reasons why uh, you can avoid that disconnect. So this is the most basic case study ever known uh, to man. And it just goes to highlight, like how often do we really disconnect? Patient comes into a merge, uh, they're either intubated in the field or intubated in the merge. Well, they don't stay in the merge, right? They're going to go off somewhere else. They're going to go off on a journey for a test to the OR, ICU, change a circuit, put a nebulizer in. Uh, as you start to go through their journey in that first 24-hour period, you can see that this is a very common journey. It's nothing actually that's out of the ordinary. And you have 20 circuit disconnections in that 24-hour period. What does that mean? That means that's 20 opportunities for the staff to be exposed to whatever's in that circuit, whether it be uh, COVID, TB, pneumonia, pharmaceutical agents. And that's also 20 opportunities 
that the lungs collapse and then have to rapidly re-expand. So if we take this and, and tie it into a study that was done on uh, pigs, half of the pig group uh, was ventilated with uh, standard parameters. The other half was ventilated with the same standard parameters, but every five minutes they disconnected the circuit. Uh, and that, that was for a period of four hours. And that sounds barbaric, but really after two hours um, of this, that's 20 circuit disconnects. And if you notice in this study that after two hours, that's when, so the 20 circuit disconnects, uh, that's when they started to see the physiological impact, right? Oxygenation dropping, SATs are dropping. And the conclusion was that the repeated derecruitments exacerbated lung injury. So yes, this is a, a little more barbaric of a scenario, but uh, we know with standard patient therapy that there's so many reasons why we disconnect the circuit. But once the circuit is disconnected, it's got to be reconnected, right? So uh, if we look at this study that was done out of Australia, where they looked at three different time or lengths of uh, duration that they disconnected the circuit, and we're looking specifically at the four-second circuit disconnect, because that seems to be the most common um, time frame to change or switch is about a four to 10 second window. But if you look at this four second circuit disconnect, once the ventilator was reconnected, the uh, set parameters reached a max of 220% of the set values. So what happens is you disconnect a circuit, all the pressures in the lungs drop to zero, everything drops to zero. And then at that point, they're reconnected to the ventilator. The ventilator overshoots to try and figure out where the settings were and find the magic numbers. And then it claws back and it, and it gets back to its uh, homeostasis or its steady state. But at which time you had complete collapse and then six breaths of varying parameters. So every circuit disconnect is, is more dramatic than just the disconnect. Uh, so with this one, it will vary ventilator to ventilator. They all will uh, react differently, uh, but they're all uh, computer chips that are looking for a biofeedback mechanism uh, to determine and get that information back from the patient to find those ideal settings. So there must be a better way, right? So the Fluso family of products was born. The original Fluso bypass was the first product released. Uh, and just a few months ago, we released a uh, lower dead space version called Fluso TFI. So we'll start a discussion on the Fluso bypass. So in short, the Fluso bypass allows for the seamless addition of a secondary ventilation source. And that really sums it up in, in one sentence as to why it, it prevents, you know, for transport, for circuit change and all those events. But in essence, it just allows you to connect a secondary source. And this way you're maintaining all the ventilation parameters uh, and it's completely seamless and instant. So here's some highlights on the device itself. Uh, and, and some that are, are extremely important is the fact that it can work with whatever you have already, right? So hospital, you already have a brand of ventilator or multiple brands. Uh, you use variety of modes based on your facility, whether they're pressure or volume. Uh, you have uh, heat wire circuits and all the components that a patient that is intubated is connected to. Fluso works with all of them. So it's just dropping this little device in there uh, any one of your staff could pick it up and use it today seamlessly. So with these standard connections, that's what allows for that. Uh, each Fluso device is individually packaged. It is single patient use uh, to a max use of seven days. The valve is the whole heart of it, and we'll get into, uh, into that discussion a little more. It's clear housing and a colored valve. So you can visualize the function and see where the valve is. We do not identify a patient demographic, we say, for any patient that can handle nine cc's of dead space. With that, clinicians can identify uh, the, the patients for it. Theoretically, it works out to be about any patient greater than uh, 10 kilograms. The device is very lightweight. Uh, if we look at the image in the bottom right-hand corner, where the blue section meets the clear section, that's a swivel that's integrated. Uh, because we're RTs and RTs just, you can never have enough swivels. The tethered dust cap does exactly that, keeps dust out. It does nothing else. It has zero function. 
uh, whether the port is capped or not, it has no impact on the function of the valve. It just keeps infection control happy that if you're traveling around the hospital, you don't have an exposed port. The product is made in Canada. It's made in Ottawa, Ontario, about 20 minutes from my home, uh, and we do 100% product testing for it. If we look at that image in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you have the blue end, which is the patient port. Directly across, straight line, you've got the ventilator port. Coming up on a branch like a Y, you have the bypass port. You have the tethered cap that reaches both uh, of the ports. And then you have the, uh, the valve. You can see that, that line, that blue, dark blue line in the middle. A couple other highlights are uh, Fluso Bypass was released in September of 2018. Uh, in September of 2018, it won the uh, Medical Design Excellence Awards in New York City. And in October of 2018, it, we won third place for the Innovation Prize at Paris, France, which was 267 products from 17 different countries. Uh, for both of those uh, competitions, we were the only respiratory device uh, out there. Other highlights are uh, that it is actively on the Premier and the Vizient uh, Purchasing Group agreements, and they come packaged uh, in a case of 25. So how does it work? So for us RT geeks on the call, it works off of a pressure differential, so meaning that P1 is greater than P2. The pressure at one port is greater than the pressure at the other port. So if we look at step one, gas going from the stationary ventilator straight through to the patient port, the valve is closed to the bypass port, patient's being ventilated, exactly. There's no difference to what's going on in every uh, hospital today. In the image below, you can see how the valve is closed off. So now uh, they say, Frank, can you take this patient to MRI? Can you change the HME? Uh, can you perform any one of the therapeutic acts? Uh, 18 different reasons why we have to break the circuit. I connect to the bypass port, my transport ventilator, or my resuscitation bag with PEEP valve. I turn on the transport vent or give the resuscitation bag two breaths. Now it's safe for me to go and put my stationary ventilator in standby. As soon as you do that, the pressure at the bypass port will be greater than the pressure at the ventilator port. And that swing valve is lazy and he'll just jump over instantly and close off the ventilator port. So then you would cap the port you're not using and you can go about your merry way on transport or change whatever component you were looking to change. Once that's done, you could switch back to your stationary vent and do it by just going in reverse. At the end of the presentation, I'll take the last, it takes me about 30 seconds per device, and I can show you real time, uh, instant, how it's used, how it works, uh, uh, real live demo. So where does it go in the circuit? Uh, so I break the circuit into two sides, patient side, machine side, patient side, endotracheal tube, inline suction, tubing that comes with the suction if your facility uses it or not, and then Fluso. So that is called the patient side because it doesn't matter where the patient goes, those components are always gonna be uh, with the patient. On the other side, it's all the mechanical components, right? The machine side, that could depend on the ventilator you're using, what you're monitoring, heated wire, regular HME. So in this scenario here, I can uncap the bypass port, connect a resuscitation bag with a peep valve that's at the head of every ventilated patient, give it one to two breaths, now it's safe for me to put my uh, stationary ventilator in standby. And now once that's done, patients maintain the PEEP, system maintained closed, they're being ventilated off the resuscitation bag. I can do whatever I want on the machine side. I could rip the dry circuit off, go get my uh, heat of wire circuit, get the water, go get my nitric oxide, doesn't matter. Whatever you wanna do on that side, you can do. Once you're done, you then just plug the ventilator back into the ventilator port, turn it on, and it'll go back to ventilating uh, as usual. So here's a couple case studies done uh, over the years. We've been collecting them from RTs in the field that just are telling us about their experience. So a little bit about you know, what type of patient it was. Uh, these happen to be about patient transport because it is the path of least resistance for flu. So it's where it just makes 
110% sense um, because that's where you have all your problems, right? Nothing ever happens when you're sitting in the ICU and there's 20 people around. It always happens when you're off on transport and you're by yourself or in an elevator. Uh, so in these scenarios, this highlights of these case studies about flu, so we're easy access and quick switching between the ventilators, no changes in the measured parameters, peak was never diminished or affected, no disruption in the ventilator um, or disconnection, no audible alarms, no adverse events, and it functioned as intended. So highly, highly boring stuff because safety should be boring. This should be uneventful. It's actually exciting for us to hear that nothing changed. Peak didn't go sky high or drop to the nothing and pressure's going all over. It just showed that it maintained this homeostasis or this steady state uh, across the board. So then along came his little brother is what we call him in the, in the manufacturing world on our side of the fence, Fluso TFI. And it was, well, why? And we'll get into more of the why. Why do we need another one? If you have Fluso bypass, why do I need Fluso TFI? So Fluso TFI works off of a different concept, but the outcome of both Fluso devices are the same. Maintain PEEP and stop the aerosol or stop the spray. So Fluso TFI, TFI stands for temporary flow interruption. And this allows you to make, uh, keep the PEEP and make quick uh, switches, whether it's components or transitions of therapy. So some of the highlights, once again, it works with whatever components you already have in your inventory or on your shelf. It is also single patient use to a maximum of seven days, individually packaged as well. It's individually packaged because as RTs, we like to hide stuff in pockets, cubbies, baskets, crash carts. We like to tuck stuff everywhere because we never know when we're gonna need it. Uh, so this keeps it clean while we, uh, we keep it hidden in our little secret spots. It works in either direction. So there is no valve inside. It works off a different concept, which we'll see on the, on the next slide. And so if somebody puts it in the wrong place, uh, it still will function. It doesn't impact uh, flow. It is lightweight. So that's one of the big differences between bypass. So this is more of a small P even neonatal uh, device. So it's eight grams and it's only 1.86 cc's of dead space where, um, the bypass was nine cc's. It's shorter in length as well. And it takes very minimal effort to activate. And what activate means is, if you look at the image uh, in the top right, you see the wings or the tabs that are coming out with little ridges on them. You're gonna put your thumb and your index finger on each of those tabs, and you're gonna squeeze it together like you're pinching off the neck of a balloon when you're blowing it up. Once you squeeze those together, the device is activated, Flow is occluded, PEEP is maintained, and once you release it, everything recoils back to normal. So it always goes back to its original shape, and so we never uh, change or increase resistance. There are tabs to prevent you from over-squeezing it. So once you just squeeze it flush to where your fingers are touching the device, uh, that is fully activated. So that's kind of the signal that we know. Uh, and then those little ridges on the side, on the tabs, those grooves uh, help us if we have lube or gump or whatever else on our, on our hands after an intubation uh, that we have grip on the device, but it also makes the device uncomfortable. So I want you uncomfortable because I don't want you holding this device for a long period of time. Uh, the, the, those tabs do not lock. So those tabs are always manually operated and in the hands of a trained clinician. So you're there, you're watching what's going on, you're watching the, um, all the hemodynamic parameters and you can't walk away, you can't lock it, you can't come back 10 minutes later. Uh, it's a major safety uh, addition that we made on this. It is packaged in the case of 25 as well and it is also made in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Fluso TFI is also uh, on the premier and Vizient agreements. So how does it work? You've got your ICU ventilator, gas going straight through to your patient. You can see the tabs uh, sticking out. And then you can see internally, there's actually a, uh, a pliable piece of tubing inside that's from a, a hydrostatic pump where those pumps are used to compressing the tubing to push fluid along. 
uh, it's of the same property. So this way you can squeeze it 19 million times and it always goes back to its original shape. So let's break this down into the three easy steps again. So step one, you have Fluso TFI in the system. Gas is going straight through. It's business as usual, and there's no change to anything you're doing in the ICU. Now you want to change an HME. You want to switch to a recess bag. You activate the tabs by compressing them. Once they're compressed, they will compress the tubing inside the device. And you can see that image shows um, that the center is uh, temporarily occluded. Then once you reconnect it to the resuscitation bag, transport vent, uh, stationary vent, you just let go and everything goes back to normal. So it's a, it's a very easy in-service uh, for your team. Squeeze it when you want to use it. Let it go when you don't. So let's look at where TFI goes in the circuit. Uh, you have endotracheal tube, then you have TFI. Yes, suction will pass through. You would bronch through. Uh, you can add your bronch adapter. That was also one of the key things um, that was looked for uh, during the COVID pandemic was people were looking for ways to keep a closed circuit uh, for bronchoscopy. And then you have that tubing in the, that comes with the suction if you use it. And then yes, there's fluso bypass in there. Um, We'll get to a slide which will show you both. Uh, you know, why would I need both or one or the other or when? And then the machine side is still the machine side. So here's just uh, looking at the physical characteristics mainly of both devices. So it's obvious, right? TFI uh, the Junior was built to be smaller and more compact. So he's shorter, he's lighter, he's less dead space. So the smaller the patient, the quicker the lung collapse and the harder it is to gain them back. So now you have a device that can go right down to uh, anything pretty much one kilo and up. One has the tabs and one has uh, the swing valve. So once again, they work slightly different. And then if I looked at integrating this into my current practice. So once you have a patient in the ICU, if you set PEEP greater than five, if you use a APRV where you're looking at recruitment, uh, if you look at lung specific maneuvers where you put your PEEP up to 40 for 40 seconds and turn it down, or if you follow the ARDSNET protocol, esophageal balloon monitoring, PAO2, FIO2 monitoring, hospitals are doing this right now. So you're already trying to improve, optimize and manage PEEP. The addition of Fluso further enhances exactly what you're already doing with a device that could, like I say, be picked up and used by any staff member instantly. So PEEP should be used within the concept of lung protection. And I think that's becoming more and more prevalent, especially in, in the research articles that are being published where it's still undefined. Is high PEEP better? Is low PEEP better? But what is concluded is you need PEEP. So maintaining PEEP is important while they decide which one, high or low. Fluso doesn't matter. It doesn't care about that. It just cares about keeping the PEEP. And if you want to use high, use high. If you want to use low, use low. Um, but at least you're always maintaining it and not changing the physiological factors of the lungs. So we'll look at a little summary here saying, okay, you just spoke to me about two devices. You got Fluso bypass on the left, Fluso TFI on the right. So when would I use either one? So if my hospital's looking at one device versus the other, or I don't know which one uh, that I want to trial, this is some of the feedback we've gotten from hospitals. And this is where, so if you look at bypass, so bypass, clinicians that use it don't like tube clamping. So tube clamping is taking a pair of surgical forceps to the neck of the endotracheal tube, squishing the tube, occluding the tube, uh, and try, so clinicians are trying to keep the PEEP by that method, uh, but that is, uh, could damage the tube, it's not regulated, uh, it's not FDA approved, and it's off-label use by the manufacturer of the endotracheal tube. So Fluso is that seamless introduction or addition of a secondary ventilation source. So there's no clamping, um, there's no damage to the endotracheal tube, it's just added in. For patients that accept the nine cc's of dead space, and the Fluso bypass will cover approximately 95% of patients in the hospital. 
Then we come over to Fluso TFI. So if you're facility tube clamps or people like tube clamping, TFI is the FDA registered and on-label use device that won't damage the endotracheal tube to allow you to basically safely tube clamp. Uh, it is smaller in dead space. So for hospitals that have smaller uh, patient demographic, clinicians that are accepting of a temporary interruption of gas flow or more like a breath hold uh, for mass training. Uh, so when you look at a paramedic service that could have a thousand paramedics spread out over an entire state, you know, it's, you can't get them in one room and, and do a pizza lunch and teach everybody how to use it. So with TFI, you squeeze it when you want to use it and let it go when you don't. It's a very easy introduction in that mass training. And Fluso TFI would cover 99%, basically everybody except your small, super creamy uh, babies. So really it comes down to the majority of, of our product sales, people like bypass, the majority of our sales are in the ICU and hospital setting is bypass. However, we do have hospitals that do a collaboration and say, well, I use bypass for my large peds in adult ICU and for my smaller peds and in, in larger uh, infants, then we use TFI. Either Fluso, doesn't matter which one you use, will maintain PEEP and minimize airborne uh, aerosols or spray or staph exposure. So here's 20 different reasons why we break the circuit down one side, and then we'll just compare it to current therapies uh, available today. So an MDI adapter. So a little adapter goes in line, allows you to put a, an MDI canister and deliver your inhaled medications. So that helps you keep the circuit closed for one out of the 20 therapeutic reasons. Then we go up to a valved nebulizer T. So it's spring loaded, allows you to put the nebulizer in and take it out and the valve will uh, spring shut. And so this will keep the circuit closed for three out of 20 therapeutic reasons. Then we go to the main one where, like I said, there's probably no hospital uh, on this presentation that doesn't use a, a closed inline suction catheter. Uh, and so a closed inline suction catheter will keep your circuit closed for two out of 20 reasons. If we add either device, so if we look at Fluso TFI, It'll keep the circuit closed for 18 out of 20. If we go with Fluso Bypass, it's 17 out of 20. And the design of both devices that they work off a different mechanical principle, you can see that the X is building up. So that's where the combination of the two devices, if you really wanted to get uh, and, and block all reasons why you disconnect, uh, you'd be looking at 20 out of 20 reasons that could be avoided. But either device on its own gives you a very dramatic increase in um, its use in keeping the circuit closed. Now, if you can see adding this in collaboration to your existing suction catheter for reasons why you're trying to keep the suction closed, you can see you have a major uh, benefit. So why Fluso? Do, why do we care about a circuit disconnect? And this is broken down into three key areas, and that's staff safety, infection control, and patient safety. So one flu cell can protect over 70 healthcare workers. If you actually sit down and look at, you know, you've got one nurse doing 12 hour days, one nurse doing 12 hour nights, you still have to have break coverage for them. Um, on both of those, then you have RT going in the room, break coverage, maybe there's a student, x-ray tech goes in, a porter goes in. Uh, you could see that when you, when you sit down and start to put the list of who's going in and out of that ICU room, you know, airborne viruses, contaminants, pharmaceuticals are not picky. Uh, they don't care what your title is. And if you're in the room, you're in the room and exposure is there. So, you look at an average of 10 healthcare workers walking into a patient room every day, you know, that's, if they do grand rounds in your hospital, 
Uh, there's probably 20 people walking into the room when they do those rounds alone. So let's look at a study now that, that quantifies this. So this was a study done by Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, through the Aerospace Engineering Program. And it was a peer-reviewed uh, publication in the Canadian Journal of Respiratory Therapy. What they looked at was an ICU uh, scenario where you had a servo I ventilator dosing the Imomax Icaria nitric oxide into a spontaneously breathing ASL 5000 lung simulator. A three second circuit disconnect was done to simulate a very quick switch uh, to a different therapy. And the Fluso method, which we described the three steps was done with Fluso bypass. Then you can see the little NO monitor. So that sniffed environmental air to determine what escaped from the circuit. So if we look at the chart, there was nothing measured when Fluso bypass was used. Uh, but when it was not used, and on a very brief three second circuit disconnect, you have a leakage of 25 to 46%. Now, why the range? The range is caused by instantly 25% was measured. And then after 33 to 37 seconds, that peaked to 46% before it started to come back down. So, in short, Clinicians are exposed to almost 50% of the dose of nitric oxide in this setup. And the whole development of this study was actually by a respiratory therapist out of a major children's hospital in Montreal, uh, Canada, who came up and said, listen, you know, I work in a pediatric center. We use nitric all the time. I know I'm sucking it up and I'm breathing it in and it doesn't make sense. And so they, they started to uh, use Fluso based on that reason alone. Patient safety. So this is kind of RT 101, image on the left, lungs completely collapsed, image on the right, beautifully inflated. So we disconnect the circuit, we drop all the way to the left, you reconnect the circuit, we wanna go all the way to the right, but we know we end up in the middle where you're just pounding the good LVLI and the other LVLI are collapsed. And in that brief scenario we discussed at the beginning, you do that 20 times in a 24 hour period, well, uh, ventilator induced lung injury, the definition of it is repeated collapse and re-expansion over and over. So this study is probably one of my favorite. It has absolutely nothing to do with Fluso. It was uh, done by the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, which this year I think was awarded the number one children's hospital in the world. It's obviously the top children's hospital in Canada. And what they did was a study looking at abrupt, right? So I always say quick circuit disconnect. And when we talk to a lot of clinicians, they say, oh, you know what? I do it quickly. So either nothing can escape or it doesn't have the same impact on the lungs and it's actually causing more damage. So the abruptness or the quick disconnect or deflation uh, in this study, they did echoes while they disconnected the circuit. And then the images, we'll just run through quickly the, uh, the images on the right. So you look at that echo, right ventricle, left ventricle, patients on a PEEP of three, and they're both you know, equally sized, nicely sized, all as well. Then you look at image B, they increase the PEEP to 11. So I increase PEEP, I increase into thoracic pressures, I squish the heart because it's got nowhere else to go, the chest can't expand. So I squish the right ventricle and the left ventricle, makes sense then I do an abrupt deflation. So you see the massive relax or expansion of the right and left ventricle. Alongside that, you completely remove all into thoracic pressure. So you have dilation of the blood vessels that line the lungs and you have lung collapse. Then you quickly reconnect the ventilator. And 30 minutes later, image D, you have this echo where the RV, the right ventricle is huge, the LV is tiny. And so what's going on is the, the reapplication and the drastic swings in interthoracic pressure, the body can't keep up. So when you have the dilation of the vessels that line the lungs, you then replace that positive pressure ventilation and you start to squish all the areas that line uh, the vessels that line the lungs, you compress them. And then now the right ventricle can't pump 
against that tiny restricted orifice. So it starts backing up and the left ventricle is getting nothing. Alongside that, you get leaky capillaries and pulmonary uh, perfusion issues. And so it's quite the impact. Uh, and the short story behind this one was I was at a mechanical ventilation uh, conference in Toronto, Ontario. They were presenting this paper. The physician ICU intensivist moderator of this, um, this discussion, at the end of, his, of this presentation, he walked up to the researcher, Dr. Katira, uh, and basically said, like, there's a guy here with a device that I think you need to meet and talk to because it solves basically everything that you concluded in your, in your study. So that's actually how the hospital for sick children uh, started to use the flusal devices. Then we look at infection control. In the drum roll question, will Fluso cure VAP? No, it won't. Nothing will. Not one thing. That's why you have a VAP bundle. It's a series of things. There are five that you will do, head of the bed and feeding. And, but if you look at the ARC evidence-based uh, clinical practice guidelines on maintaining a ventilator circuit in its relation to VAP, all of its summary recommendations ultimately lead to keeping a closed circuit, right? Everything that they're looking at, uh, you know, nebulizer, caution with nebulizer, manual uh, ventilation, patient transport, you know, uh, uh, pre-COVID, all the febrile illness guidelines for management of a ventilated patient said to use a heated wire circuit, not an HME, just because you have to change an HME every 24 hours. So they don't want you breaking the circuit once a day uh, to minimize this. So Fluso easily adds in to anybody's existing VAT protocols uh, and then further highlights all of these uh, clinical practice guidelines. So let's take a look at uh, a value analysis to say, uh, we'll look at it from the lens of uh, a clinical person, RT, and we'll look at it from an administration standpoint to say, why would I consider this device? What impact would it have? So from the RT standpoint, I can, I can speak for myself. Um, so maintaining PEEP, better patient care, right? We spend, I worked in ICU. So, you know, most of my focus was managing that ventilator. Uh, so PEEP was of utter importance. So improving the lung ventilation strategy and improving lung safe ventilation. Uh, the fact that I could just grab that device and it works with all ventilators, all modes, high frequency, all circuits means I could just pick it up and use it. And, you know, there's no difference in, in the technique. You connect your secondary source and turn it on. And then uh, it's no different than what you would do today. I don't want to be exposed. I know, uh, you know, my invention of this, my original uh, issue was the exposure. And this was, you know, going back uh, 15 years ago, uh, to which COVID uh, in its current state didn't exist. I did work through the 2002 SARS and the H1N1 and all the other fun ones. Uh, but whether you're bacteria, virus, pharmaceutical, I don't want to inhale any of it, period. Uh, it's easily added to a VAT protocol, a ventilation protocol, a PEEP titration, COVID policy. So it's basically seamless and allows me to provide safer patient transport and transitions of therapy. From an administrator standpoint, I get to minimize the risk of ventilator associated pneumonia. I also get to minimize risk if we're tube clamping that I can go now to a regulated device for that and not have to worry about the legal liabilities of any complications of tube clamping. I protect my staff from airborne contaminants and through, through that, uh, there's the possibility of reducing sick time, reducing testing time, costs of testing. Uh, I think what highlights now uh, more than ever in our COVID world is all staff is overworked, all staff is tired, all staff is fed up, all staff is just really running at wit's end. And so the last thing you need to do is take somebody out of commission, you know, you go one staff member down and, and it puts strain on the rest of the team. Maintaining optimal PEEP. Why do I care if I'm an administrator about optimal PEEP? Well, in theory, 
you maintain peep at the bedside, you do an optimal peep study, and you go up one, down one, and you find that magic number for peep. Once you circuit disconnect and reconnect, you've now changed that standard baseline number. Your interthoracic pressure's changed. So in theory, you now need to reset that optimal peep. So having to reset or reassess optimal PEEP after every circuit disconnect is a waste of RT's time at the bedside when there's 9 million other things we could be doing. Quick and easy uh, staff training to implement. So as an administrator, you know, like I said, it's very intuitive devices. They could pick up and start using them today without issue. Uh, they're very, very uh, easy to integrate. More efficient patient transport and transitions of therapy. So if I can save some time, have it more efficient, have it more effective, and not have staff, like I said, wasting time um, where there's no need. Lastly, it's compact, easily added to inventory. So uh, inventory, I think, you know, you can fit 25 flusos in a uh, basically four by four, four inch by four inch by eight inch box. Uh, so it easily adds in one SKU of either device covers 95 to 95, uh, 99% of patients. So, you know, you have huge coverage from that one small uh, SKU. And then I like to break it down that as a clinician, my goal is to provide safer patient therapy, but also protect myself. And from an administration standpoint, to provide more efficient patient therapy and protect my, my team. Magic, uh, you know, looking at a cost analysis of it, if you, if you really wanted to uh, break it down to the sheer dollar cost. Uh, in every hospital in North America, if we were to look at the financial cost uh, for Fluso and compared it to a variety of therapies, Fluso costs you less per day than everything listed. An inline suction catheter, heat of wire circuit, evac uh, endotracheal tubes, and you can see the list goes on and on. So it's adding something in for, you know, a couple bucks a day that has this major impact. And, you know, patient and, and staff safety is, is priceless. It's a bonus in all this. I like to say respiratory therapy, our entire profession is about small, small gains or small wins. We make very delicate, intricate, calculated changes to increase patient care. We can move PEEP up one and down one. So maintaining this PEEP plays into everything that we do every day. Alongside that, there are no longer the in, easy to ventilate patients. When I started off as an RT 19 years ago, you know, you failed a non breather and we intubated you. You didn't really need to be intubated. That was the next uh, tool or in our toolbox that we had available. Now you have high flow therapy and BiPAP. So if you fail all those modalities and you're intubated, you are not going to be easy to ventilate because you failed all the non-invasive stuff. And so now for you to be on 10, 12, 20, 25, 30 of PEEP is the new norm. When I first started, uh, if you were on eight centimeters of water of PEEP, they would call the students in to see and now at our hospital, uh, we start at eight. So the patients are changing and the patients that we ventilate are changing as well. So I will switch back just to my video. And what I can do is just jump in and show you uh, the devices. So if I, in every ICU out there today, we have a nice, lovely, expensive $50,000 PB980 servo, not the Evita 4 that's old in, in the back here. Uh, so you've got your ventilator giving your gas to the patient. Patient's lungs are inflated. Everybody's happy. And they say, go to MRI, go to CT, change the HME. So we disconnect quickly, reconnect. And so we saw that rapid collapse and then that very, very quick re-expansion, both causing damage. So all we do is add in Fluso bypass, 
And you can see once it's pressurized, there you go. So same scenario, my lovely expensive ventilator, patient's lungs are inflated, Luso's added in. You can see the valve here is closed to the bypass port. So now in this scenario, they say, Frank, go off and go to MRI. So I uncap, I connect my secondary ventilator source, hook it up, turn it on. If you saw that flip, it flipped. So now you can see the valve is closed off to the ventilator port. Nothing happened to the lungs. I know it's very boring. They didn't collapse. They didn't reinflate. And I would cap that port and go off about my merry way. When I get back to the ICU, I grab my very expensive ICU ventilator, turn it on, take that off, cap it. Lungs remained inflated. And you can see that the valve is closed to the bypass port. All day long, that valve will just flip back and forth and back and forth. So now I take Fluso TFI. So with TFI, you can see that's not activated, activated. So I'm squeezing it flush. Now, if I look through this way, you can see my keep the peep shirt. It's closed off. I let go, it goes back to normal. So when that's added in, ICU ventilator, patient's lungs inflated. Now I look here, the tabs are there. I squeeze the tabs, disconnect the ventilator. He's disconnected, lungs are still inflated. Change my HME, hook it up, let it go. That's it, done. Lungs stayed inflated, kept the peep, stop the spray. So I will check. Um, Frank, you do have a question. I guess this is time for the question and answering um, yeah, portion. So yeah. there, we do have a question uh, from Summer. Uh, question is, is this safe for use on spontaneous breathing patients? She typed this in while you were discussing the Fluso TFI. Yes. Um, sure. is, it, is it safe for use for spontaneous breathing patients? I typically do not clamp ETT unless a patient is passively breathing. Correct. So because so this is where when you clamp, clamping takes you longer uh, to do than activating TFI, right? Because by the time you clamp and then you let go, you lose your clock, right? You're not necessarily kind of counting uh, how long it's been since it's been clamped. I've seen uh, major incidences happen where, you know, oh, they dropped the HME on the floor and they, I'm just going to run and grab another one. And now you're looking at a period of time. So with TFI, you are physically holding it. The RT is there. So yes, you're always cautious when they're spontaneously breathing, but you're also right there at the head of the bed with the patient. And if they're spontaneously breathing, uh, if they are somewhat alert, then it comes with the coaching as well, right? So listen, we're going to be doing this. I'm going to be, you know, it's going to feel an occlusion. Just relax for a bit, almost be like a breath hold, uh, explaining what's going on to whether or not they're looking at you at, or not. I always explain it, uh, period. And then from a bypass standpoint, uh, completely irrelevant on the spontaneous or not. If that answered your all parts of your question, Summer. That was the last question on the, uh, on the chat feature. Uh, if you would like to uh, ask a question, please, if you would like to go on mute, uh, unmute, excuse me, and uh, ask Frank, or if you'd feel more comfortable, you just type it in the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. I'll, I'll ask myself questions if nobody has questions, because maybe I'll answer some, some questions that are, uh, um, We'll go through this bypass. Uh, there's a valve inside. Is it gravity dependent? If I look at it being set up, I like it, and this is just my OCD, or I like it in this scenario where the bypass port is facing up. So now if it's tube, it's sticking up. So you have full access 
It's not down into the chest of the patient. Will it impact its use? You could have it upright, you can have it upside down, or you can have it gangster on the side, whichever one works for you. The valve is not impacted. It's the, the flow pushes the valve open and the pre pressure maintains the seal. And that's how it's working. Um, humidity doesn't have an impact. So once again, because you're hooking up a bag, right? If I look at this valve, I'm hooking up a mechanical source to it and I'm saying, move. So that's the scenario where humidity hasn't Im impacted any of the valves in use. Uh, we did different testing with the muca mist, uh, which is probably some of the stickiest uh, substance out there. It's super, super sticky. Uh, and, and there was no issue at all. Uh, I just see that question pop up. Um, so it's used on all patients. So right now, um, at the Ottawa Hospital in, in Ottawa, Canada, uh, in, in collaboration or in total, it's 85 ICU beds. Uh, there's two COVID patients in the ICU, uh, but the ICU is full. So you still have 78 other ventilated patients that have bad lungs, that have, you know, peep is peep, is peep ir irrelevant to COVID. Uh, so the benefits of Fluso where you optimize your strategy if you're using esophageal balloon or peak titration or anything like that when you're managing the patient, keeping the PEEP is irrelevant, um, COVID or not. The other thing is other uh, disease processes of, you know, ARDS and things like that, where you, you could lose recruitment quickly. It's almost more important uh, in those scenarios. But like I mentioned earlier, the easy to ventilate patients are gone. So it's, it's kind of one across the board. I always give the scenario as well, where, you know, when the inline suction came out, RTs, we were sticking down a 50 cent catheter uh, and suctioning the patient. And then they came out and said, hey, we've got this great thing, it's 30 bucks. Uh, 2002, SARS hit Canada. And they said, okay, instead of the 50 cents, we'll spend the 30 bucks and it's used on everybody because you can't tell if you have COVID, don't have COVID, have another disease, have TB, right? I know in our center, could be we, we don't do TB testing on site, it has to be sent to another hospital. And it could be three or four days before we find out in that time who's exposed. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, if it is billed as part of the ventilator circuit, that we will have to get back to you on. Lori, we'll, we'll get back with you on that. But you did yeah. ask and I couldn't answer, so that's yeah. Any other questions for Frank at this moment? The other thing is our website, I could even enter it into the chat, uh, keepthepeep.com. So we have, we had to build a website that was for education purposes, right? Obviously the use of Fluso once COVID hit went through the roof because of its staff safety benefits alongside uh, the patient safety end of it. And so there's detailed videos and images, instructions for use, uh, the research article from Carleton University, that's all on the website and, and it's nicely laid out in, in my opinion, of course, it's biased because I built the website, but we tried to make it because once all these hospitals started uh, using Fluso and sales reps were locked out and educators were locked out, it was a way for us to train people without being on site in collaboration with Zoom presentations in our new lovely world. Frank, you want to give your email address if it, anyone has any direct questions? Absolutely. I'll throw it into the chat. Great. And as he's doing that, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, really appreciate your time today. Uh, if there, anyone has uh, any, uh, any questions, uh, concerns, comments, uh, obviously we, we, we value your feedback. Uh, just get directly with your sovereign medical sales representative or uh, if you don't know who your sovereign sales representative is, uh, you can email us at care 
at sovmed.com. And I'll actually type that in real quickly here at sovmed.com. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you again, uh, Frank, Frank, for your wonderful message today. And everyone have a great afternoon. Be safe, be well, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.